If you look at the back of the program, you'll see a statement of purpose explaining why we do convocation, some of the history of this practice. Um, and as you'll notice, uh, practices like this that go are shaped over hundreds of years, and then from one continent to another, and then in each specific institution. So at Gateway Seminary, it's developed over the decades to be this uh, event each semester where all of our faculty fly in from our regional campuses, from Arizona, Pacific Northwest, Rocky Mountain, Bay Area. We all gather, so you see the, the, the large uh, um, collection of our faculty here, uh, to hear from each other on our ongoing research. Uh, so this is an academic-oriented chapel service. It's different from our normal chapel services. Uh, where faculty members take turns sharing what are they researching, what are they investing their, their time in, what questions are they trying to, to understand and to solve uh, and make an academic contribution. So they share that with each other and then also with whoever else uh, joins for chapel. So it's a, a, an opportunity for students as well and for staff to see what are our faculty up to in their research, in their academic endeavors. What contribution are they make, making on an academic level? And this is the context now for convocation. Uh, and it's followed up afterwards by a lunch that's uh, just for faculty where we, we grill each other. You know, it's, it's a, a good uh, discussion. We could challenge each other and say, you know, you know what, what do you mean by that? Have you thought about this? Um, so I think, uh, John, half of it for Dr. Taylor will take place here, and the other half will be following uh, where we get to explore his ideas uh, in more detail. Um, so thank you for joining us today. In just a moment, it's my privilege to, rec uh, to introduce our speaker for today. But before I do that, let me just say a word to those of you who are guests about the temperature in the room. Uh, Gateway Seminary has not run out of money to pay the light bill, but the air handling system on the first floor of this building has failed. And we have ordered the parts to replace it and have been told those will take four months to arrive. And so in the next few months, we're going to have some cool days and probably in uh, late spring, some warm days in this chapel, but we do have repairs on the way. Well, our speaker today is Dr. John Taylor. You can read his biographical summary in the program that you've been provided. I'd like to just highlight one aspect or two aspects of it for you today. First, I think John Taylor is my favorite Australian faculty member. <laughs> Second, John Taylor is a model faculty member in this regard at Gateway Seminary. You see in his biographical summary more than 20 years of service as a field missionary, coupled then with decades of preparation and service to, uh, to lead in the academic program of a school like ours. Our faculty are the beautiful coming together of missionary passion and academic excellence. And with that in mind, I present to you our speaker for today and invite you to welcome Dr. John Taylor. Well, hello everybody. Great to be here with you. And we're gonna be talking about the Lord's Dinner, restoring the common meal to the center of the church's common life. You know, one of the curiosities of historic Christianity is that we participate in a meal, the Lord's Supper, which is not a meal at all, but the merest token of a meal, a fragment of bread and a sip from a cup. It's a reminder that there was a meal once with Jesus presiding. In first century churches, when they met, ordinarily ate a proper meal together, a meal including the bread and the cup. And the, this meal was at the heart of their common life and worship. It was in this meal context that they sang, shared teaching, prayed, used spiritual gifts, and proclaimed the message. It was a meal with extras, so to speak. The thrust of this paper will be to show that this meal practice of the early church was central and vital to its common life, to show how the church gave up eating together, and to argue for the return of that common meal, the Lord's dinner, to the center of contemporary church life for the sake of biblical faithfulness community, and mission. The church has emphasized the vertical dimension of the Lord's Supper, individual communion with God, but neglected its horizontal social dimension, communion with one another through table fellowship. Well, when the early church met together, it ate together. Table fellowship in Jesus' ministry. When the New Testament portrays the church gathering, it usually portrays it as eating together, 
This should be no surprise when one considers the significance of meal settings in Jesus' ministry as portrayed in the Gospels. Jesus traveled and ate with his disciples and sometimes acted as the host when outsiders joined the group for meals. He shared tables with the undeserving and fed the hungry. In the Last Supper, Jesus not only interpreted his forthcoming death as the new covenant sacrifice, he established a fellowship meal with its key signs of the bread and the cup as both a memorial meal and an anticipation of the eschatological banquet to come. Well, we can look at communal meals in the Mediterranean world of the first century. Early Christians, of course, were not the only groups meeting over a meal. Great significance was attached in first century Mediterranean world to sharing meals. And communal dinners, variously expressed, were central to the life of many communities. Eating together, table fellowship, signified and embodied acceptance, honor, and peace. Greco-Roman voluntary associations gathered around areas of commonality, such as occupation, worship of a god, ethnic origin, household membership, Of course, there was always a religious element, no matter what the gathering. They held common dinners, usually once a month, and often also provided for funeral dinners and memorial meals of deceased members. The meals, no matter what the association, typically followed the Greek banqueting pattern. Most Greek formal meals began with the participants reclining in strict order of precedence. Well, we're not actually going to be relying on couches in the lunch after this, as as much fun as that would be. Uh, They eating a variety of foods, including bread, and ended ended with wine, which transitioned events from the meal proper, the daipnon in Greek, to the symposium or drinking party, which could be devoted uh, to association business, discussion, philosophy, or to entertainment, drunkenness, and excess. There was an established tradition of Jewish critique of such dining, 2nd century BC Book of Syriac, warns its readers not to be greedy or drunk in banquets. Do not reach your your hand for everything you see and do not crowd your neighbor at the dish. (laughs) Faculty, just remember that for the lunch after this. (laughs) Do not aim to be valiant over wine, for wine has destroyed many. Philo compares the pious Essene meals eaten with simplicity and joy with the debauched and drunken feasts of the Greeks. The Romans, too, critiqued the excesses of the Greek banqueting tradition, though they gradually adopted the same practices. Juvenal laments the growing profligacy and immodesty of Roman banquets in the empire and looks backward wistfully to the simpler feasts of the senatorial era. Cicero commented, commented, for our fathers did well in calling the reclining of friends at a feast a convivium, in Latin, because it implies a communion of life, which is a better designation than that of the Greeks, who call it sometimes a drinking together symposium, and sometimes a dining together syndetnon, thereby apparently exalting what is of least value in these associations above that which gives them their greatest charm, end quote. Some of the Greek and Latin associations had rules which sought to inhibit various excesses associated with banqueting, and even Greek writers occasionally criticized the excesses of their own banquets. And, you know, the New Testament shares this critique of the Greek dinner culture. Well, Jewish groups also found community over meals. The standard synagogue meeting did not involve a meal, being devoted rather to prayer and the discussion of the law. Later rabbis even banned meals from happening in the synagogues. However, archaeological evidence points to a number of ancient synagogues as having dining facilities, especially in the diaspora, so community meals did happen at times. And special occasions such as Passover required a communal meal with at least 10 men present. But communal meals were also held on other more frequent occasions such as Sabbath or Sabbath Eve dinners. And Jewish formal meals began with the breaking of bread and finished with a cup. Joseph reports how Julius Caesar gave permission for the Jews at Delos to collect money for common dinners. And evidence from Comrade and Philo points to the importance of meal celebrations for Jewish groups such as Essenes and the Therapeutae. Well, we're going to look briefly at meals in the book of Acts. After the ascension, the New Testament evidence begins in Acts 2.42, when the newly baptized believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Then in verses 46 and 47, Luke says, and day by day, devoting themselves with one mind in the temple, 
and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking food together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. You know, the breaking of bread in these texts echoes really to the feeding of the 5,000, the Last Supper, Passover meal, and the meal on the road to Emmaus. The practice of breaking bread and, and sharing bread at meals becomes the practice of the church. It's significant to note also the missional impact of the church's life described here, so that in Acts 2.43, fear or awe comes upon every soul in Jerusalem. And in 2.47, which is a summary comment on the church growth, uh, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And this directly follows the description of the favor among the people, which comes as the community breaks bread and eats together daily. Note that the main verb in Acts 2, 46 to 7 is metalambanon, means they took. So the taking of food, that is to say the eating of meals together, was the context in which they broke bread, worshipped, and had favor with the people leading to church growth. Well, elsewhere in Acts, we see inside a church gathering in Troas, which took place on a Sunday and included a meal and the breaking of bread, and plus a long speech by Paul. How long have I got today? The Lord's dinner in 1 Corinthians. Other evidence in the New Testament shows a number of problems associated with church meal practices. That is, of course, why we hear about them in the letters, since these problems have to be addressed. It's no surprise that problems emerge around meal practices, given the centrality of common meals to ancient Mediterranean cultures and the mixture of cultures and races in the early churches. And in 1 Corinthians, there's a most, the most detailed discussion in Scripture of the early church's gatherings. Once again, we find meals at the heart of these gatherings, described especially in chapters 10 through 14. 1 Corinthians 11:26. after relating the tradition of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper, Paul explains, for as often as you eat this loaf and drink the cup, you are proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes. You know, the bread and cup should not be seen in isolation. Paul is concerned that the way the meal is proceeding in Corinth negates its intended meaning. However, he does not tell them to remove the bread and cup from the dinner. They have meaning within the meal context. It's not simply the so-called elements of the bread and cup, but the entire common meal and the unified and loving way in which it took place, which were intended to have symbolic value as a memorial to and proclamation of Jesus, to interpret his death for both insiders and outsiders. You know, but this richly symbolic meal has been largely replaced in ecclesial and liturgical practice by a symbol of a meal. And this historical movement has arguably obscured the distinctive character of the dinner which Paul envisaged. How then did Paul envisage the Lord's Supper functioning? The first point, which should be obvious, is that the Lord's Supper was a meal. Paul uses the word synerkamai six times in this letter, meeting to gather or come together. And it's clear from the context that at least the first four, probably the, all of them, relate to the meal gathering. And in 11.33, it's explicit, when you come together to eat. In other words, this was a central activity they, get, they gathered for. The daiknon, dinner, was the dinner or main meal normally taken in the afternoon. The expression kuriakon daiknon, which we translate the Lord's sup Supper, I'm calling the Lord's Dinner, was clearly known to the Corinthians. It was most likely how Paul designated the meal in his apostolic teaching. As an expression, however, it did not become a technical term for the ritual in the early church so much. It was nearly always attached to exposition of 1 Corinthians 11. When the fathers used the expression the Lord's Supper, they're generally either commenting on or quoting this passage as describing a full meal. For example, Chrysostom complains that the Corinthians were making the Lord's meal into their own private meal when it ought to be a common meal. Well, numerous attempts have been made to reconstruct the precise details of the Corinthian community meals, and there's been some debate over the order of events. Those inclined to separate the bread and cup from the meal itself often favor a meal bread cup order, while others favor bread meal cup. The cup is easier to place than the bread. It happens after dining, as Paul says in 1125. The place of the bread is less clear, though the bread meal cup order fits well with the description in the letter. In that case, the bread and cup frame the meal. It's, it's possible the bread was eaten at some other point during the meal, and of course it's important to recognize that bread and wine may have been all that was available for the meal. 
In the gospel accounts of the Last Supper, Matthew and Mark both describe Jesus taking bread while they were eating. But after the prediction of the betrayal, Luke has a cup and bread at the beginning of the meal and a second cup after dining. In 1 Corinthians 10, the cup is mentioned before the bread. However, the cup, as Paul cites how Jesus instituted it, was, was, as we have seen, taken after dining and thus seems to function as the conclusion to the meal proper and perhaps the transition to the next part of the gathering, as it's portrayed in chapters 12 to 14, in which the church prays, sings, teaches, and uses spiritual gifts. The two elements of bread and cup are, of course, joined symbolically as representing the body and blood of Christ, but they're not joined in Paul's instruction as a single event separable from the rest of the common dinner. The bread seems to be taken either at the beginning or somewhere during the meal, and the cup is at the end. And this way they frame the meal. There's nothing in the letter which would encourage their detachment from the meal proper. Paul does suggest it would be better if some people ate and drank at home rather than cause the kind of trouble happen in Corinth, but he doesn't really want that to happen. In that case, it would still not be the Lord's dinner. He never suggests that the Lord's dinner should be reduced to a symbolic event consisting only of tokens or samples of the elements. Believers should ex instead examine and judge themselves and in this way come together and eat and drink in a worthy manner. Paul still, Paul still wants them to come together to eat. What Paul portrays is a true common meal, but in one in which the food is not the most important thing. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he told them that they were not eating the Lord's Supper or dinner. That's in 1120. By this, he did not mean that they were failing to drink the cup or eat the bread, or, nor were they failing to have common meals at all. They were indeed gathering to eat, and they were drinking the cup of blessing and breaking bread. What made the Corinthians' meals not the Lord's Supper? It was that the manner that they met and ate together meant that the Lord's name should not be attached to their meals. Paul makes some explicit critiques. First, he says in 11.18 that when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. Now, this might refer back to the divisions that Paul mentioned having heard about in one, chapter 1 between fans of Paul and fans of Apollos. These divisions might be manifested at the gatherings. It's likely, however, that social and economic divisions were also present in view of the shaming of the have-nots in 11.22. These divisions and the seeking of honour seems to have exacerbated the problems at the Corinthian meals. <clears throat> Many consider that the root of the problem to, <clears throat> excuse me, to be the rich elite <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> feasting in traditional fashion in the dining room or triclinium of a wealthy patron's house, perhaps before the poor arrive, while the poor have to eat whatever was left <clears throat> in the more exposed atrium. Paul is concerned with their behavior at the meal. Some went hungry, some were drunk. Each was taking or devouring his own meal. Some were dining as if they were in the hard partying atmosphere of some Greco-Roman banquets. Others were left with nothing to eat. <clears throat> as a result, the church had experienced a bout of illness and some deaths. You know, Greek, Greek and Roman public dining was built around elaborate displays of honor and status. Normal dining took place, place with one's own peers, but even then, the social hierarchy was evident in the rigid ordering of places at the table, and at times, a variety of food given to guests of different status. These cultural norms could not be continued within the body of Christ. The meal, as held in Corinth, no longer reflected the Lord's character and his practice contradicted its intended message. Paul reminded them of the meaning of the meal and of the sacrifices of Jesus on their behalf and he called them to self-examination and self-judgment regarding this matter, regarding the manner in which they are participating in the meal, and to recognize the body, that is to say the church, and to welcome one another. Thus in Corinth there is disorder and division at the meal. Paul's assessment is that this is shameful. The church cannot be praised. His explanation for shaming them, they should know better, because he'd already informed them of the origins of the Lord's meal, the Lord's dinner. Now they're reminded again of the words and actions of Jesus. You know, in verse 26b, sorry, in verse 26, Paul explains the commands to eat and drink the bread and cup. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Well, the first part of the verse, <clears throat> as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, really means that for Paul, Jesus has claimed the common meal of the church for himself. Even though Paul talks of Christ as the Passover in chapter 5, 
and the Lord's Supper has clear Passover resonances, there's no evidence that Paul transferred the entire rabbinical Passover tradition or even the scriptural Passover ordinances, such as eating unleavened bread, to the regular practice of the Lord's Supper. The description of the meal celebration is notable in its simplicity and minimal ritual. By comparison to both the Jewish Passover festival or to the sacrificial practices and libations of Greco-Roman banquets. Farther, further, Passover was an annual festival in a single city. The frequency of early Christian meal gatherings suggested they never saw the Lord's Supper simply as Passover. And the quarto decimon debates in the early church over the date of Easter suggest that if any event were thought to be a continuation of Passover in a substantive way, it was Easter rather than the Lord's Supper. And in fact, Easter was often called Pascha or Passover. The second part of verse 26 points to a proclamation function of the meal. Unbelievers are meant to see and experience a meal which is a message. The visible love and unity of the church, the body of Christ, lived out in holiness and, and without class distinctions. The common meal of the church, the Lord's dinner, is meant to establish the church and identify it as a united body, a community which shares in the body and blood of the crucified and resurrected Messiah, which remembers him, proclaims his death, and anticipates his return. Thus, the memorial meal, looking back to the death of the Lord, is a fellowship meal intended to unite the church around the table of the Lord. It's also a proclamation event announcing his death and anticipating the return of the Lord. This is the significance of the meal. And this is why, as Paul concludes in verse 27, those who partake in an unworthy manner are guilty. They're guilty because when they don't properly discern the body, the proclamation of the death of the Lord is tarnished. The community meal was intended to be a community event and a missional event. The meal is the message. But it was failing so severely in Corinth that it could no longer have the name of the Lord attached to it. The Lord's dinner in Romans. It's not always recognized that Romans has also extended teaching about the common meal of the churches. At the end of chapter 13, Paul makes an explicit warning against revelry, drunkenness, and other aspects of the Greco-Roman dining culture. And he says, to make no plans for the flesh and instructs his readers to walk properly as in the daylight and put on our Lord Jesus Christ. In this context, he immediately turns to discussion of the church's meal practices. Not, however, to forbid them to eat together, but to exhort them to do so properly with regard for one another. Scholarship on Romans 14 and 15 has focused largely on discovering the identity of the weak and of the strong and the weak. The basic facts are simple enough. The weak eat only vegetables uh, and not meat because they count it as unclean. There are also hints that some at least have scruples about keeping certain days special and don't drink wine. Though these could simply be illustrative. For the strong, all foods are acceptable. Well, theories abound about what is behind this passage, but something of a consensus has emerged that the passive passage concerns differences between Gentile and Jewish elements among the churches at Rome. The explanation given in 15, 8 to 9, Paul says, For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcision for the sake of the truthfulness of God, so as to confirm the promises of the fathers so that the Gentiles would glorify God for his mercy, points to the basic division the passage is referencing between Jews and Gentiles, which is overcome in Christ. Most, however, would qualify the identity of the groups, arguing the label strong also includes some Jews who have abandoned rich, uh, strict adherence to dietary restrictions, like Paul, who counts himself among the strong, while the weak might well include some Gentiles who have adopted certain Jewish practices. I'm I am taking this basic position as a starting point but locating the discussion of the weak and strong in Romans 14 and 15 in the context of first century community meal practices, arguing that the passage primarily addresses the common meals of the Roman believers. The presenting issue in Romans 14 is, what's on the menu at the Lord's Supper? The gatherings Paul envisages involve Jews and Gentiles eating and drinking together, chapter 14, and also singing together, chapter 15, 1 to 13 probably in that order. This combination is similar in structure and order to what found in Paul's discussion of the church gatherings in 1 Corinthians, where we saw that there was discussion of the meal in chapters 10 and 11, precedes, and that precedes discussion of prayer and the use of spiritual gifts in chapters 12 through 14. The repeated call to welcome or receive others in Romans 14 and 15, the exhortations not to judge or despise one another regarding matters of food and drink, and the prayer for united worship suggests a situation where believers are divided, 
Paul is concerned that believers in Rome are not gathering to eat and worship as they should. Jews and Gentiles may even be gathering separately, and because the community probably has a Gentile majority, the effect is that Jews are excluded from the church's common meals. By the way, do you know what it means when a preacher takes off the watch and puts it on the podium? Nothing. It means nothing. <laughs> so, the need to welcome one another necessitates overcoming differences over purity concerns between the weak and the strong, enabling an other-serving, Christologically informed table fellowship and a one-voice expression of worship. The strong should be prepared to adjust the menu at community gatherings to enable the weak to participate without stumbling. The strong must be prepared to back down on the dispute over the menu. Eating together is important. The menu is not. The Lord's meal should be undertaken with faith and with thanksgiving and honor of the Lord, remembering that the kingdom of God is not about food and drink. The Old Testament quotations Paul then uses in Romans 15, 9 to 12 at the end of this passage are chosen not simply because they illustrate uh, the unity of Jews and Gentiles in the gospel, but because the united praises of Jews and Gentiles are for Paul the proper expression of the hope inherent in the gospel. This makes the whole passage from Romans 14, 1 to 15, 13 the demonstrative climax of the letter and points to the church's common life in meal and song as a demonstration of the gospel. Other New Testament evidence. Other briefer windows into first century church gatherings in the New Testament also show believers eating together. As described in Galatians 2, 11 to 14, the well-known controversy between Paul and Peter erupted when Peter, Barnabas, and other Jewish believers withdrew from eating with Gentile believers in Antioch under the influence of some people from James. Paul vigorously confronted this separation before them all. It's clear that the community meals of the church in Antioch are in view. Paul was adamant that to separate racially at the meal table, even for the sake of purity concerns, would be inconsistent with the truth of the gospel. The command in 2 Thessalonians 3.10 that someone unwilling to work should not eat is not an injunction on the church to enforce starvation upon some errant believer but orders their exclusion from the church's meal provision, which would include exclusion from the common meal, the Lord's Supper. In Ephesians 5, 18 to 20, the exhortation is not to be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit as you speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs suggest a meal context for the church's worship gatherings. 2 Peter chapter 2 contains a warning about the rise of false teachers in the church. They promise freedom Peter says, while being themselves slaves of corruption, 2.19. But in what context do they share their false teaching? According to 2 Peter 2.13, they revel in their deceptions while they feast together with you. Or as a New Living Translation has it, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. Paul is not critiquing the church meeting to eat or even to feast, but warning them to beware of a licentious takeover of the church's meal gatherings. What we can know is that the church gathered around a meal or feast, and this is when teachers were heard. Similarly, the letter of Jude warns against people who creep unnoticed into the churches and turn the grace of our God into licentiousness, verse 4, devile the flesh, verse 8, and their hidden reefs on your love feast, Jude says, feasting together with you and shepherding themselves without fear. Yet Jude does not instruct the churches to abandon the meal called love. This brief survey of New Testament evidence of the church's meal practices has not shown, of course, that there is a command for the church to eat a proper meal together, but that the first century church ordinarily ate together when they met together, and that this was the Lord's Supper or dinner. The bread and cup were taken where they naturally belonged, in the context of a meal. In addition, the emphasis of most of the passages have been on community and unity to be found around the table of the Lord. This horizontal dimension of fellowship at the meal table is what so much historical church practice has neglected. Now, the abandonment of the Lord's Supper as a community meal, separating the bread and cup from the dinner, that was the first step. It's not certain when the separation of the bread and cup from the church's common meal occurred, but evidence suggests that the split began in the second century and was largely completed by the fourth century. 
Then by the 7th century, the common or agape meal itself was largely abandoned. Some of the uncertainty over the timing of this abandonment may be drifted, attributed to a variety of expressions in use by the church, including the Lord's Supper or dinner, uh, breaking of bread, uh, thanksgiving or some Eucharist, uh, love or a term sometimes translated as love feast. Of course, thanks, of these, uh, thanksgiving or Eucharist is the one not found in the New Testament, though it derives from the prayer of thanksgiving Jesus made for the bread according to the trad tradition shared by Luke and Paul. It's likely that at the beginning all these terms denoted the same event with different connotations, but later as practices began to change, it's not so clear. The early second uh, Christian document, the Didache, deals with the Lord's Supper, uh, calling it the Thanksgiving, or Eucharist, at the end of a list of issues which concern, in order, uh, idle food, baptism, fasting, and praying. Detailed instructions are given about the prayers to be said, before partaking of the wine and bread, they, do, they, they don't resemble at all the so-called words of institution in the Synoptic Gospels or in 1 Corinthians. Participation is limited to the baptized, and the cup precedes the bread, and a final prayer, which among other things celebrates the gifts of food and drink for enjoyment, is said after everyone has had enough or is filled. This suggests strongly that the event was a meal and had not yet been reduced to a token of a meal. The breaking of bread was to happen on the Lord's Day, though it doesn't appear to be limited only to that day. You know, around the same period, Ignatius, the overseer or bishop of the church in Antioch, writes to the church at Smyrna that the only thanksgiving, Eucharist, which is valid, is that which is under the overseer or bishop. It's impermissible, he says, impermissible to baptize or hold a love feast without the overseer. Here, the thanksgiving, that is Eucharist, and the love feast are probably the same thing viewed from different aspects. Cultic language is used. Practice one thanksgiving for there is one altar. Thus, at least at the start of the second century, the churches met together to eat, and in that context, they took the bread and the cup. There seemed to be a number of factors which led to the separation of the Eucharistic bread and cup from the love feast and the eventual abandonment of the love feast or common meal altogether. One is persecution. So Pliny's letter to the Emperor Trajan from Bithynia describes the churches in his province meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God, after which it was their custom to separate and to then to reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. Pliny says that he suppressed this meal meeting as forbidden by Trajan's edict against associations. Well, persecutions made it hard for Christians to gather in large numbers and for formal meals. However, this was not the only factor as after persecutions against the church's ease in the early 4th century, normal meal service was not resumed. A set of interrelated factors at work in the early centuries of the church included the growing liturgical formality and structure of church gatherings, the tendency to treat the Lord's Supper as a sacrifice or offering, uh, the treating of church leaders as priests, making those offerings, and the reckoning of church buildings as holy sanctuaries or temples. In the mid-2nd century, Justin Martyr describes a Thanksgiving or Eucharist as occurring subsequent to the baptism of new believers and also every Sunday, when all believers gather from town and countryside. After the scriptures are read and taught and after prayer and followed by the collection of money to help the needy in the church, and the Thanksgiving consists of bread and wine mixed with water. There's no mention of food other than the bread and wine being shared, though with the gathering by foot of people from towns and villages and portions said to the absent and help to those who need it, it's likely sufficient for a proper meal. Tertullian in North Africa writes in 197 AD of the agape meal taking place in the evening, starting with prayer, followed by food and drink in modest portions. He calls this event the Lord's Supper or dinner. In part, the meal serves to help the needy. Then after hand washing at the end of the meal portion, when each person stands and sings a hymn, either from the Bible or one he's composed. And you had to do that to prove you were not drunk, by the way. After which prayer finishes the evening. And this is the event he defends against accusations of cannibalism, suggesting that the bread and cup, body and blood of the Lord, were part of this meal. Elsewhere, however, defending certain practices where scripture gives no rule, and even where a rule was discerned in scripture, he says that the Eucharist was taken before dawn in congregations, even though he notes that the Lord commanded it to be taken at dinner time. By Eucharist, he means the elements, not a ceremony, and it's possible that this morning event was using bread reserved from the previous evening agape meal. 
Fifty years later, in the same area, it's clear from Cyprian's writings that the main Eucharist gathering was no longer a meal and no longer in the evening, but the morning. Possibly this is because there's no room for everyone to recline at a meal. Abandoning the love feast. An increased emphasis on asceticism seems to have contributed to the abandonment of the agape meal or love feast, which had connotations of celebration, feasting, and was open to the dangers of excess. Fasting, not feasting, was the order of the day. Clement of Alexandria states, some, speaking with unbridled tongue, dare to apply the name agape to pitiful suppers redolent of savour and sauces. Dishonouring the good and saving work of the word, the consecrated agape with pots and pouring of sauce and by drink and delicacies and smoke, desecrating that name they deceived in their ideas, having expected that the promise of God might be bought with suppers. I don't think Clement of Alexandria would have, fought, would have been a fan of TV cookery programs. <laughs> Chrysostom exhorted the faithful to take great care of the poor and restrain our appetite and rid ourselves of drunkenness and be carefully, careful worthily to partake of the mysteries. And although he looks back longingly to the love feasts of the first churches, he seems to envisage a situation in his day in which the Eucharist was celebrated in liturgical gatherings, followed by a retreat by the wealthy to private meals, which could be the occasion for drunkenness and which by definition excluded the poor. By the mid-third century, the Eucharist was only occasionally, for most believers, at least a proper meal, and the liturgy focused on the bread and cup as a sacrificial offering performed by a priest according to strict ritual. The agape, or love feast, still existed separately, not so much as a common meal of the church, but as a special meal put on for the poor, especially poor believers by the rich, though it could sometimes still have elements included. It also increasingly regulated, it was also increasingly regulated by church ordinances. The growth of martyr-centric church life led to love feasts at the tombs of martyrs and also at funerals, and these were sometimes hard to distinguish from pagan ceremonies. Augustine criticized the drunken feasts held at the tombs of Christian martyrs, and he makes note of bishops, including Ambrose, banning funeral feasts. He goes even further. Not even innocent and temperate feasts were permitted in the church. The regional synod of Laodicea, AD 365, forbids the agape from being celebrated within church buildings, meaning that a clear distinction between the church's common meals and the liturgical celebration of the Eucharist was in place. The church building, uh, the synod said, was the Lord's house or the house of God and was regarded as a holy temple. The love feast, therefore, was counted as unholy or at least likely to occasion unholiness. This effectively banned the agape meal in many situations. The Synod of Gungora in, in the mid uh, AD 300s, on the other hand, anathematized those who despised believers who hosted love feasts. But this still shows that the ascetic, anti feasting pressure was building. The Council of Carthage in 397 banned bishops, clergy, and ordinary people from dining in church buildings, except through necessity, such as for travelers coming through. And love feasts continued longer in the Eastern Church than the Western, but the Council of Constantinople, or Trillo, that's in the East, of course, in 692, reiterated the ban on love feasts in church buildings. Thus, the community meal of the church lost its significance and seems to have vanished from most portions of Christendom, apart from certain feasts and festivals. Even on those occasions, not much actual communal feasting tended to be done. The only significant remnant of early communal meal practice was within the intentional communities of the monastic movement. Well, restoring the Lord's dinner, remnants of the table. Institutional memory and habit since then has conditioned many Christians to think of church gatherings only as a worship service in which preaching, prayer, singing, and non-meal form of the Lord's Supper have been practiced. Taking the bread and cup out of the meal and receiving them within a different setting changes the symbolic framework for the Lord's Supper and it inevitably makes it more vertical and horizontal in focus. The common experience for many of going to church is of sitting in a row, looking at the back of someone's head and watching a performance, either of a concert and a lecture or of a liturgical tradition. What might be the, ex what might be the experience if going to church included sitting across a table from someone, sharing food and talking together? We become friends with those we eat with. The New Testament records, it's a big pardon. The New Testament records show churches which ate together as much as they prayed, sang, or preached. 
It was basic, intrinsic, and normal to their common life. And it was in this meal setting where food and drink fit far more naturally that the Lord's Supper was celebrated. More precisely, the church's common meal was the Lord's Supper, framed by the elements of the bread and the cup. And this setting gave the, the, the gathering a dimension of mutuality and fellowship, which Paul sought in his letters to protect. There's nothing, however, in Paul which suggests that this dinner could or should be truncated from a symbolic meal to a, to a symbol of a meal. Protestant churches have criticized uh, Catholic churches for holding to transubstantiation, the idea that miraculously the substance of Christ's body and blood are present in the Eucharistic bread and wine, though the accidents of the bread and wine remain as they were. Yet Protestant churches seem to share the view that a meal can exist even without its accidents. Apart from the merest fragments, the church has retained the language of the meal without its substance. Thus, there is talk of coming to the Lord's table and partaking of the Lord's Supper when there's no supper and usually no table. There is talk of table fellowship, though no one is communicating with each other in any meaningful sense. Certain groups, such as Plymouth Brethren and Scottish Presbyterians, have at times required communicants to take the elements seated around a table, though still in the context of a traditional service without a proper meal. Those of Baptist, Baptist or Baptistic convictions have long criticized churches that sprinkle or pour water in baptism because, it is argued, the relevant biblical terms signify immersion, but also because the symbolic value of baptism is diminished. The rich symbolism of full immersion, whether of burial, according to Paul, or of complete cleansing, as elsewhere in the New Testament, is replaced by a mere tokenism, and the message is thus rendered far less potent or even lost. But could we, along with a vast majority of the Christian tradition, have done exactly the same thing with the Lord's Supper. The church has apparently solved the problem of selfishness and drunkenness in the Lord's, Supper, Lord's dinner by not having a, mo a meal at all. But in doing so has lost much. I am suggesting that this loss should not be made permanent, restoring the table. That there would be numerous practical difficulties in reinstituting this meal practice in 21st century church and mission practice goes without saying. That doesn't stop me from saying it, of course. But that is largely because churches in the West for at least the last 1,300 years have mostly abandoned the practice of common meals. Now, there have been some modest scholarly proposal suggestions recently to reintegrate the bread and cup into a meal setting. And some of modern American churches are adopting this practice, including a movement called the Dinner Church, which claims over 300 churches in the USA across multiple denominational traditions who have a meal at the heart of their worship gatherings. A group of Korean churches recently began to focus all their main worship gatherings around meals understood of the Lord's Supper and presented their experience at the Society of Biblical Literature meeting, annual meeting in 2022. Some brethren churches have traditionally celebrated the Lord's Supper as an agape meal once or twice a year. However, the overall numbers are still small. Much larger is the number of churches in non-Western cultures who eat together as a matter of course, though few recognize or practice it as the Lord's Supper, which is usually still celebrated within a traditional liturgical framework. But in a culture of growing isolation, in which fewer people are even eating with their families, let alone the church, the church has the opportunity to be both scriptural and countercultural to demonstrate and proclaim the gospel, to restore community, and to reclaim its own lost heritage. There is a growing interest in the restoration of meal and hospitality culture to the church. The missional possibles, possibilities, the missional possibilities are striking, both in Western and non-Western situations. Some issues, of course, would remain the same. Churches, including our own, which restrict, restrict the consumption of the particular elements to those who are baptized, would have to administrate this much as they always have. Divisions in the church would still have to be overcome. The early church dinners obviously had their problems, and the reintroduction of church around the table is no panacea or instant fix, but nor is it just another program. The point is not to condemn or to judge the tradition of the church or to create a new law which churches must obey, but to press forwards or backwards to a more biblical practice. Instead of a richly symbolic common meal, which has its meaning as a meal, which is a fellowship and proclamation event as a meal, we consume a mere symbol of a meal, a symbol of a symbol, 
and in the process of transferring the event to its typical liturgical setting, its intended ecclesial and missional functions have been neglected. Martin Luther said, now the more closely our mass, our mass resembles that of the first mass of all, which Christ performed at the Last Supper, the more Christian it will be. He was comparing the simplicity of Jesus' ceremony with the elaborate medieval ritual of the Mass. But the sentiment still holds true. A return to the oft-neglected practice of regular common meals for the believing community with the framing and defining elements of the loaf and the cup would more closely fulfill the missiological, theological, and ecclesiological intention of the Lord's Supper as set forth by Paul. Thank you.